The village of Cookfield in West Sussex holds a special place in the world of paleontology as a place where some of the very first dinosaur fossils were found. In this series, I've already looked at two dinosaurs that have come from Cuckfield, Pelorosaurus and Hyliosaurus. But these weren't the only dinosaurs that were found there. Now, Cockfield was one of the favourite fossil hunting places of the early paleontologist Gideon Mantle, and he was the one that described most of the dinosaur discoveries that came from the quarries on the outskirts of the village. In this episode, I plan on looking at three poorly understood dinosaurs Regnosaurus, Cuckoofieldia, and Voloraptor. All of these animals come from the Valangian stage of the early Cretaceous period between 134 and 139 million years ago, with a depositional environment that was a shallow freshwater one. And it's only by comparing them to the remains of better understood dinosaurs that we actually have any idea of what these animals might have looked like. Not only from a partial ripe mandible, Regnosaurus was hard to identify. Mantle originally thought that it was the jaw of a juvenile iguanodon, and it was Mantle's nemesis, Richard Owen, that disputed this on the grounds that there were no remains for comparison with Iguanodon at the time. Now, it didn't take too long before we did actually end up with some jaws of Iguanodon coming from other sites, and Mantle did indeed change his position and renamed the animal Regnosaurus Northamptony in 1848. If you're wondering about the name, Mantle renamed it after the Regni, a pre Roman tribe that lived in the area of Sussex, and the species name, Northamptony, was named after the Marquess of Northampton, Spencer Compton, who was at the time the president of the Royal Society. Now, in 1888, Richard Lydica thought that the jaw came from a Scalidosaurus, and in 1909, Friedrich von Huhn considered it a member of the Stegosaurian. In the 1970s, however, it was considered Nobum Dubium, due to the sheer lack of material. I mean, after all, it is just part of the right dentary. This again changed in 1995 when paleontologists Paul Barrett and Paul Upchurch connected it to the Chinese dinosaur Huyangosaurus that had been discovered in the 1980s and noted that the jaw bones were actually very, very similar and that Regnosaurus is now considered, as Friedrich von Huna suggested, a basal stegosaurian. With only a jawbone that's about 7.5 centimetres in length, it's really hard to get a feel for the full size of this animal. So comparing it to a Huyangosaurus, it's thought to be around about four and a half meters long. Another right dentry from Cupfield was found by Mantle in 1848 and was also assigned to Iguanodon. Now you might think that yet another find being assigned to Iguanodon demonstrates uh, poor science or at the very least a lack of imagination on the part of early paleontologists. But 1848 was very different to 2020. Only five dinosaurs at the time were known. Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, Hylosaurus, Tychodontosaurus and Cetiosaurus. And even then Tychodontosaurus wasn't actually recognised as a dinosaur until 1870. In fact, Dinosauria as a clade had only come into existence a few years earlier in 1842. So this whole concept of dinosaurs was really, really brand new and very few of the early paleontologists actually had any idea of just the sheer breadth of biodiversity that would be found within the fossil record. And in fact, in 2020, you're looking at around about a thousand species of non avian dinosaur known to paleontology. And that also doesn't include the whole variety of other extinct organisms that we know from the fossil record. Now as I already said, Cucophilia was originally assigned by Mantle as a species of Iguanodon. Due to the limited quantity and quality of the remains, it is tentatively considered a separate species of basal Iguanodontid. The fragment itself is about 52 centimetres in length, which when compared to other Iguanodontids, gives an estimation of the size of the animal around about 6 metres long.
And then for our final dinosaur of the day, Volvoraptor. Now, Volvoraptor is known from the partial metatarsus, that's part of the foot, approximately 24 centimeters in length. Now, it's first thought to come from Hylaeosaurus when Richard Owen first described it in 1858. And it was John Whitaker Hulk in 1881 that first recognized it as being part of a ther theropod. And in 1888, Richard Lydicker assigned it to the species Megalosaurus. However, a lot of species were assigned to Megalosaurus in the mid and late 1800s. Remember again, this is a time when dinosaur biodiversity was just not known. And Megalosaurus had become a wastebasket taxon where many a meat-eating dinosaur was assigned to Megalosaurus as a species. Like many of the other dinosaurs that were assigned to Megalosaurus, it ended up being reassessed on multiple occasions and ended up doing the rounds between different genera of dinosaurs. It was assigned by Friedrich von Huhn to the dinosaur Altus in 1923, and in 1991, George Olszewski assigned it to its own genus of Volderaptor as part of the whole clean of the top place of the Megalosaurus genus. It was at one point considered part of Neovenatar, Eotyrannus, and Baryonyx, and for almost three years it was also considered Nomum dubium. This again changed in 2007 when paleontologist Darren Nash showed that it did have features that were distinct from the other theropods, and thus Volderaptor was back on the list. Now that other finds to further flesh out this animal, Nash was only able to describe it as a basal tetanurian theropod without being able to specify which particular family of theropods that this animal actually came from. However, a more recent study in 2014 suggests that Volderaptor might actually be a ornithomimosaurid. And if accurate, this makes Volderaptor the only ornithomimosaurid found within the British Isles, as well as potentially one of the oldest ornithomimosaurids known anywhere in the world. Again, it's hard to get an accurate estimation of the size of Volderaptor considering the quality of the finds that we've got. However, comparing it to other ornithomimids, you're looking at an animal that is somewhere around about five meters in length. So comparable to Gallimimus in size. So what can we learn from these three dinosaurs? Well, firstly, that despite their poor remains, by comparing them to better known animals, we can still get a rough idea of what these animals look like. Secondly, as more information becomes available and more detailed studies are performed, we need to be willing to change our ideas about these animals to fit with the current evidence. And thirdly, that there was a great degree of biodiversity in the formation that now sits buried underneath Cubfield.